Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. So, we have seen that for flows at very high Reynolds number, the viscous stress term in the equation of motion can be neglected when we compare to other terms. And the flows can be considered inviscid. This we have seen from our dimensional analysis of the equation of motion. Of course, we <coughs> non dimensionalize the incompressible flow or constant density flow equation, but this is even true if we consider the full compressible flow equation that when the Reynolds number is very high, the viscous force term present in the equation of motion can be neglected in comparison to the other terms. This term is much smaller than the other term present in the equation. <coughs> the Reynolds number which you have defined as a characteristic velocity, we took it to infinity I think, some characteristic length divided by the fluid viscosity or also quite often written like this. <coughs> also this is a ratio of the inertia force and viscous force. So, our a very high Reynolds number means that the inertia force are much larger than the viscous force. That the ratio of the inertia force and viscous force is given by this term that can be easily seen that the inertia force term in this equation is this term. This is the inertia force term and this is the viscous force. And again if you take the order of magnitude the inertia force you can take any term in the inertia force that is either rho du d t or say rho u du d x. The result is the it is rho u square by L. The order is rho u square by L, whether you take rho du d t because t is again of the order of L by u. So, rho u du rho du d t or rho u du d x any of these term that gives its order rho u square by L and the viscous force here you can see the order is mu u by L square. So, again the ratio is this Reynolds number. So, a very high Reynolds number flow implies that the inertia forces are much larger than the viscous forces and under such condition as you say that this term can be dropped from the equation. And so, high R e this implies And the equation of motion then can be written as the 
which we call that these equations are known as Euler's equations. Momentum of conger momentum conservation for an inviscid fluid <coughs> or inviscid flow. As far as mathematical difficulty of this equation is concerned, it remains almost the same because the difficulty in solving these equations comes because from the nonlinearity of the equation and which is present again here also. However, we see a very important outcome of this simplification. When you neglect the viscous term from these equation, the equation reduces by one order. The original Navier-Stokes equations are second order equation while Euler's equations are first order equation. And the effect is that the Navier-Stokes equation needs two boundary condition while this needs only one boundary condition. That means, we cannot satisfy the two boundary condition if we solve Euler's equations and the boundary conditions for the most important problem of flow over any body as you said that on the surface there will be no slip that there is no relative velocity which is expressed that normal component of the relative velocity as well as the tangential component of the relative velocity both are 0. If we make this approximation at high Reynolds number that the flow is inviscid then we can satisfy only one of these. We can satisfy that the normal component of the relative velocity is 0, but we cannot satisfy that normal component of tangential velocity is 0. <coughs> now, let us see what actually happened in the physical problem. Considering a physical problem, let us see what happens. Just think about we have a uniform flow. In uniform flow, all the stream lines are parallel and straight lines. And let us say at we call that time instant t equal to 0, at that at time t equal to 0, we place say a simplest possible body, consider just a flat plate. We place a flat plate in that flow, in the uniform flow. Now, this flat plate will occupy the position of one of the streamline when you place it in the flow. Now, before the flat plate was placed along that streamline, the flow velocity was say u infinity. Now, the instant we place the flat plate there, because of that requirement of no slip condition on the surface of the flat plate, which was earlier a position of the streamline, the flow velocity will there become 0. Okay. Now, on the adjacent streamline, which is at a distance of 0 plus, the flow velocity still remains that u infinity. So, at t equal to 0, we have let us say where we place the flat plate, we call that the sum of the x axis. So, that is y equal to 0 at y equal to 0, we have flow velocity u infinity. At t equal to 0 plus, at y equal to 0, the flow velocity becomes 0, but at y equal to 0 plus, the flow velocity still remains u infinity. Now, what does it mean? That there is a velocity gradient d u d y of the order of infinite because over a distance of 0, the flow velocity has changed from 0 to u. Now, what is du dy? du dy, you see the, if we can component of the vorticity, the omega z is du dy minus dv dx or dv dx minus du d, dy. So, dv dx is of course, 0 along x direction there is no change, the flow velocity is 0 everywhere. So, at y equal to 0, we have created an infinite amount of vorticity. The instant we place the flat plate, 
its implication is that we have created an infinite amount of vorticity on y equal to 0 a vortex set. If we consider it a two dimensional case, we have created a vortex set of infinite strength. Now, we have already talked about something on vorticity, we have also derived a vorticity transport equation, we have seen that a vorticity at any point changes because of its convection with the flow, because of its viscous diffusion and also because of some local redistribution due to its rotation and stretching. This stretching and rotation of course, is a local redistribution. So, it do not contribute much to the global transport. So, the global transport is by convection and diffusion. Now, what will happen then as t equal to 0 plus as we have created this infinite vorticity we know whenever there is a very high concentration of any quantity whatever it is this viscous diffusion takes place it tries to smooth out that concentration so that there will be not very large concentration at some region so the viscosity or the viscous effect will try to spread it in all direction even though it is created at y equal to 0 this viscosity or the viscous effect or the viscous force whatever you call it will try to spread this vorticity in all direction. So, that there is no high concentration at any region. So, because of this viscous action the vorticity will try to spread in all direction that is to the front to the back to the sides in all sides. However, we now also have a convection and this convection as in this case is parallel to the body surface, the flow velocity is now parallel to the body surface. So, this convection will of course, try to take away the vorticity away from the body surface to downstream direction only, this convection is not trying to take it to other side. The problem that we have considered in this case the convection will try to take it only along the flow and the flow is parallel to the body surface towards downstream. So, this convection will try to take the vorticity away from the body surface to the downstream, while the viscous action will try to take the vorticity in all direction to the front, to the sides, to the back. So, out of this four direction you see to the back in both cases combined the convection is also trying to take it back take it in the backward direction viscous action is also trying to take the backward take it in the backward direction. So, there is no conflict the effect will combine. However, as far as the viscous action towards front and towards side you see that will be opposed by the convection that will be opposed by convection and this convection if it is strong enough will not allow the viscous action to spread the vorticity to a larger distance in the front as well as in the sides. So, in case where the convective forces or the convective action is much stronger than the viscous action what will happen? This vorticity will remain confined very close to the body in the front as well as in the side however, in the back it has no objection it will go on. So, what will happen that if let us say this is the body and the viscous action will or the balance between the convective action and the viscous action will keep the region to which vorticity can be spread. To this part of okay. this is to the infinity in this side there is no pull. So, to these two sides as well to the front the convective action will not allow the vorticity to spread further by viscous action. <laughs> we will <coughs> 
Now, come back to that problem that we considered that a suddenly started plate, a plate suddenly started moving. This is equivalent problem, whether we move the plate suddenly or we place the place a plate suddenly in a uniform flow, the problem is equivalent. So, in that problem, when a body or a flat plate started moving impulsively, we saw that the vorticity spreads or diffuses by viscous action to a distance which is proportional to root nu t. If you remember, the distance to which vorticity diffuses is proportional to root nu t. <laughs> now, in this problem, what will be a characteristic time? Looking to this problem, where we have placed a flat plate in a flow, what is the characteristic time? We can take this is the characteristic time during which flow remains in the vicinity of the body. Now, since the characteristic speed of the body is u, characteristic speed of the flow is u infinity and the characteristic length of this flat plate is L, that is the length of this flat plate is L. So, what will be the time during which the flow will reside near the body? So, L by u infinity. This is the order of the time during which the flow will remain near the vicinity of the body. So, this time we can replace by L by u infinity. So, this is a characteristic time that is time during which So, the distance vorticity spreads root nu t we have replaced that t by a l by u infinity. <coughs> now, how much is this? How much is this root nu l by u infinity? How much is this? Is it of the same order as l? Let us see what is the condition at which it will become of the order of l. If we say this is of the order of l, and it will happen then if u infinity l by nu is of the order of 1. So, if this do not treat this equality in the actual sense of equality, these are some order of magnitude, it is of the order. So, they are not equal in that mathematical sense, they are of the same order. So, number 2 and 7 they are of the same order. So, if you want you can even put a that order of notation. that it means it of the order of this. 
that is order of this length is order of this length does not mean that they, those lengths are equal one may be 5 times 8 times 3 times of the other and so on. <coughs> and this then imply that So, if the Reynolds number is of the order of 1, just about 1 or 5 or 7 or 10, then the distance to which this vorticity can spread is of the order of the L. However, if the Reynolds number of the order of the Reynolds number is too high, if the Reynolds number is too large, then it seems that the thickness will also be very small the distance to which the vorticity can spread will be very small. If the order of Reynolds number is of 1, then the spread will be of the order of L. If the order of Reynolds number is much larger, then the spread will be much less than L, very, very small compared to L. And you see then the vorticity is confined, the vorticity is confined to a very narrow region near the body. Outside that region, there is no vorticity. That is coming back to this figure that all the vorticity will be confined within in this part. Outside this, there is no vorticity. Okay. This narrow region, later on we will call it boundary layer. So, name of this narrow region is called boundary layer. and the thickness of this region becomes smaller and smaller as Reynolds number increases. <coughs> this concept was postulated or brought in by Prentl, one of the greatest fluid dynamicists little over 100 years ago to be precise in 1903 he postulated this <coughs> and before that what is known as the subject of classical hydrodynamics had no answer to many of the problems. Some of those problems we will encounter shortly, not now, but within a few days. <coughs> so, what essentially it means that when the flow Reynolds number is very high or the viscous forces are much smaller compared to the other forces present, then we can treat the flow to be irrotational that is without vorticity 
except in a very thin region near the body, except in a very thin region near the body, where the vorticity can not be neglected and so the viscous action that near that within that thin region within that thin region the effect of viscosity and vorticity they cannot be neglected however high the Reynolds number is. However, as you will see that in many practical cases where you are concerned about meters of distance or meters of length a millimeter can be neglected this you will see of the order of some millimeters a few millimeters in a practical problem thinking about say a uh, the flow past an aircraft this region is of the thickness of few millimeters while we are concerned with say 10 meters 20 meters 50 meters or even higher larger distance so in that one millimeter is practically negligible so you see that in all practical cases we can neglect the effect of viscosity as well as vorticity. The effect of viscosity and vorticity both can be neglected at very high Reynolds number except in a very thin region of the flow. <coughs> However, we will see later on what will be the repercussion of this theory. <coughs> Sorry, I couldn't give you. Does the effect of this uh, vorticity and this will have any significance on the body motion? We will see it. Definitely, it has. As I said, that without this concept, see this. This is the concept. It is called that this concept bridged the gap between classical hydrodynamics and the practical aerodynamics. That without this. Many, many questions cannot be answered, many questions cannot be answered. So, even though we are saying that it is very small region 1 millimeter and ok 1 millimeter is a very small region, so it hardly matters, but we will see that it matters greatly later on. Though it is quite natural to think that ok this 1 millimeter is uh, uh, hardly of any worth, we can safely ignore it. Yes, we can ignore it for certain respects, but there are some questions which cannot be answered even without considering this very, very, very thin region. And the reason is as I mentioned earlier that what it makes, okay, it is simplifying the equation a little bit that is not matter that we have dropped this term from the equation. The most important effect comes because we are dropping one boundary condition. And you know that what is the importance of this boundary condition in any practical problem because that boundary condition alone decides what the problem is. See as far as the flow of air is concerned whether it is a cyclonic flow over the building which breaks down the building brings down the building or the same air flow over an aircraft which gives it the lift force to fly. The same the governing equation is the same, same Navier Stokes equation no change. The same Navier Stokes equation applies equally to all these problems or even to the oceanic flow or the oceanic dips all are governed by the same equation. Not only that even the say the galactic flow or flow within a star they are also governed by the same equation. Okay. Some forces perhaps we have not written explicitly in some particular problem, some forces may be considered, some forces need not be considered. What we have mentioned simply a body force that body force can take different term, but as such the equation is concerned it is the same equation, but obviously we will not say that okay, what is that uh, river flowing gently and a cyclone flowing over a building and then breaking it down they are the same the difference is the boundary condition. That boundary condition alone gives the character of the flow and what happens to this simplification? Okay. Dropping the term is not important, 
if we could take that boundary condition even with dropping that term perhaps we will get much better result. That we do not get many thing because we are unable to satisfy that boundary condition when we drop this term from the equation. <coughs> Now, with this say high Reynolds number approximation or inviscid flow approximation, let us say what, what happens to the incompressible flow vorticity transport equation. So, vorticity or incompressible vorticity transport equation at high Reynolds number. The equation was d omega d t equal to there is plus new Laplacian omega. At high Reynolds number the viscous terms are negligible. So, that new Laplacian omega becomes practically 0 we drop it. So, this is what happens to the vorticity transport equation at very high Reynolds number or in visit flow. Out of this, this we have already said that this is this represents the rotation of the vortex filaments as well as stretching or deformation of the vortex filaments and this contributes to a local redistribution of the vorticity. It is not a global transport phenomena, it is a local redistribution phenomena. How the vorticity in a particular region is distributed, it simply, it simply alters that. And this term is exactly equal to 0 in two dimensional flow, because the vorticity is then perpendicular to the plane of the flow. In two dimensional flow, the vorticity is perpendicular to the plane of the flow. So, in two dimension, this is exactly 0. So, you can say in, in two dimension So, this of course, we saw earlier without considering the dynamics from the kinematics itself we saw something like this that the strength of the vortex filament remain constant which we termed as Helmholtz theorem. So, again from dynamics we get the similar observation that the strength of the vortex filament remain constant, vortex filament cannot end in within the fluid either it continues to infinity or it ends in itself that means, it forms a closed loop. So, all these are obtained from here also. <coughs> we look for another very special result from here which is known as Kelvin's theorem on circulation. Circulation we, as you remember is an associated quantity to vorticity. If you remember that circulation we defined as line integral of velocity over a closed circuit or over a closed path, which by Stokes theorem can be written as 
the flux of vorticity across an open surface bounded by this closed path. So, the circulation is <coughs> flux of vorticity across an open surface bounded by the closed path on which you are finding the circulation. And how this circulation changes in a particularly in an inviscid flow is known as Kelvin's theorem. Kelvin's theorem on circulation. We will consider the inviscid incompressible flow of a homogeneous fluid and also we will consider the body force is derivable from a scalar potential which is a single valued function of position, a single valued scalar potential of position. So, inviscid incompressible Inviscid incompressible flow of a homogeneous fluid Now, consider a material closed curve, not just any curve, consider a material closed curve. We are not considering a special curve, we are considering a material curve, a curve made up of certain fluid elements. So, that means as the fluid element moves, this curve also moves, and okay, the fluid elements will move with different velocity, so the curve will also go on changing its shape and size. Will steal it. If you want, you can even it write it as a function of time because. <laughs> so, 
Now, what will be rate of change of this circulation around this closed curve? Would like to find that. Since the circulation is around a material closed curve and we are always keeping that material closed curve in this whether you write this conventional small d or that capital D for material derivative is immaterial. But on the right hand side we have to write that substantial derivative because that u the velocity u is defined for at a point it is not defined for a material material point it is defined for a special point. And this becomes here also you can make it small d, no problem because this length element is of a material element. So, here this small d itself means a material derivative or substantial derivative. So, the first term on this can be expressed in terms of the governing equation. What is that? What is this? What is this? So, this is not plus, no, this is minus, sorry. What is this? this term what is this? Hmm? Velocity that is the velocity again. So, okay. so this becomes u dot u and we as before we will write like this. <coughs> now, we have considered a homogeneous fluid and for that this an incompressible constant density. So, this becomes <coughs> a 
actually one half will come. <laughs> okay. Now, how much is this integral? First of all, say look term by term f d l around a closed path f is the body force per unit mass how much it will be the integration over a closed path uh, how much it is magnitude wise 0 okay it is a scale. that is why we consider the body force as a single valued potential if it is not single valued it need not be 0 okay but see that that is most practical is most often the body force will be the gravitational force and okay it is a single valued potential. So, this is 0 again this is a perfect differential this is also 0 p by rho gradient of p by rho integrated over a closed path is again 0. What about this last is 0? Integration of say the kinetic energy around a closed path is 0. You come back to the same position now, so it is 0. So, the entire right hand side has become 0. So, you see that the it says that in an incompressible inviscid flow of a homogeneous fluid provided the body force is a potential single valued pot body force is derivable from a single valued potential then a rate of change of circulation of a material closed curve is 0 or the circulation around a material closed curve will remain constant. So, circulation in a material closed curve will remain constant. The flow may be unsteady, we are not saying the flow is steady, but the circulation will remain constant. Of course, provided the flow is inviscid, incompressible, so the fluid is of homogeneous fluid and the body force is derivable from a single valued potential. But you see that all these are not very strict restriction or not very strong restriction body force derivable from a single scalar potential, single valued scalar potential that is the most natural case, that is the most natural case. So, when we put that assumption we are not restricting much. <coughs> the fluid is quite often homogeneous, other inviscid okay. the flow needs to be higher Reynolds number then it is practically inviscid and incompressible. Okay. We have not yet seen under what condition the flow is incompressible, but we will see shortly. <coughs> and in particularly you see then that if the circulation is originally 0, then it will remain 0. So, if there is no circulation when the flow starts, then it will always remain 0 for this type of flow, inviscid, incompressible. <coughs> so, you see that as you have already mentioned that flow over a body is simply sum of a uniform flow 
plus due to extension flow due to a vortex plus a flow field in which there is no vorticity, no extension or cylindrical rotational velocity field. So, uniform flow is always there. So, that uniform flow from which we start the flow, there is no circulation. In an uniform flow, there is no circulation. So, it seems that subsequently also there will be no circulation. According to Kelvin's theorem, <coughs> since the flow originally had no circulation, it will never have any circulation or circulation will become 0. <coughs> now, we have seen that okay, there are certain situations particularly when the flow is at very high Reynolds number, we may consider the flow to be rotational except within a thin region and that thin region we can practically neglect or we can say whatever solution we have obtained that solution is valid outside the boundary layer. The solution is valid outside the boundary layer, the boundary layer is neglected. Okay. However, we are continuing for some time that incompressible flow. We have already defined that incompressible flow are flows in which the change in density is negligible due to change in pressure. That is, the density does not change because of change in pressure. But does it really happen that uh, density is not changing because of change in pressure? We have seen what will happen if the flow is incompressible if density does not change with pressure, okay, so many things will happen. We have the continuity equation, the simplest possible form divergence of E equal to 0, if the flow is incompressible. Okay. And the incompressible flow is those flow or incompressible fluids are those fluids whose density does not change due to change in pressure. The most common fluid, the most important fluid to us, the air, we know it is not so if pressure changes the density of air changes, okay, water still perhaps little acceptable, if you change pressure density of water does not change much negligible, but air is too difficult too hard to believe that air is a fluid whose density does not change due to change in pressure. We see that very small pressure itself changes its density. Then can we use all these anything for air? Now, we will see that okay, this is what we say the definition of incompressible fluid that density does not change because of change in pressure, but is there any situation where this can happen that density is practically not changing or change is negligible if the pressure changes. Okay, one perhaps without doing anything we can say that okay, if the pressure changes themselves are very small if the pressure changes themselves are very small. So, the pressure changes by say 2 percent, 3 percent of the pressure, whatever pressure we have it changes by 2 or 3 percent or 5 percent. Perhaps with that small change in pressure the density will not change. So, when the pressure changes are very small we can say that the density changes are practically 0 because of that density. So, only small pressure change perhaps we can consider. But that is of course, a qualitative answer. We will look for now some quantitative answer that under what condition the flow can be considered incompressible and the result of that incompressible flow that the velocity field is solenoidal. So, we will see under what condition a flow or fluid can be considered incompressible and its velocity field is solenoidal. this is what we will try to do now and of course, then we will look for some solution of that type of flow. <coughs>